Well, welcome to today's talk. It's uh, Thursday, the 24th of June. Now, the best meta-analysis so far on the efficacy of ivermectin has been published. So we're going to look at that. Now, I know looking at these studies aren't for everyone. It's, it's a bit scientific and it's kind of journal reading stuff. So I'm going to give you the, 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 the headlines and the, or the bottom line really on this now. Now, this study shows that ivermectin probably reduces deaths by 62%, probably reduces deaths by 62%, and possibly reduces transmission by 86%. And you notice I said probably reduces deaths by 62%, and possibly reduces transmission by 86%. So that's the result from this meta analysis, which we're now going to look at in detail, and I'd love you to, to stay. It is pretty interesting, actually. Now, this is the publication here. It just came out on the 17th of June, so it's, it's a few days old now. Ivermectin for the prevention and treatment of uh, COVID-19 infection. We see the authors there, and uh, Tess Laurie, of course, we've had the uh, enjoyment of um, interviewing twice on this channel. And during that time, Tess did give us a lot of this uh, information that's in this um, before it was published. But the big difference now, it's published, um, it's in this It's in this journal, the American Journal of Therapeutics, and, and it's peer-reviewed. So this is peer-reviewed. And this is particularly important because a meta-analysis, as you know, is looking at the results from many different trials, combining those, reanalyzing that data and reinterpreting that data. And that is intrinsically quite a complicated thing to do. So you need good quality peer review to make sure that this technique, that this methodology was correctly followed. And given that it's been published, I think we can assume that it was correctly followed. It certainly looks good to me. In fact, parts of it are beyond me, actually. But um, I think I've worked out most of it and we'll, we'll go through it now. So ivermectin for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 infection, a systematic review, meta-analysis and trial sequential analysis to inform clinical guidelines. So um, background to this. Now, the, uh, the antiparasitic agent ivermectin um, with antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties has now been tested in numerous clinical trials. So here they're clearly saying that it's got antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties. The question is, to what degree are they efficacious? Uh, now, 2018 application for ivermectin used for scabies gives a direct cost of 290 for 112 milligram tablets. I mean, this is an incredibly cheap drug. It's off license. It's generic. It can be manufactured in huge amounts in India. Remarkably low cost. So if it did work, it would be really good because it's a very, very cheap uh, intervention, low cost therapeutic. Of course, that's particularly useful in countries where they have got very limited resources. Now, most trials were registered, self-funded and undertaken by clinicians. So these are not trials done by large pharmaceutical organisations. Uh, they're not trials done by governments. They're trials mostly done by the actual clinicians, the doctors and uh, their assistants who were actually working in the field. And very often they've done this research as well as their day job. So they were largely self-funded by the clinicians themselves rather than officially sponsored. Now, the, we, we, this is we assess. This is the team uh, from the meta-analysis. Efficacy of ivermectin treatment in reducing mortality and chemoprophylaxis as a prevention of uh, COVID-19 and preventing um, cross-infection, spread of infection. Now, um, data sources that they used in this. Um, up to the 25th of April 2021. Now, this is quite important because recently there's been some international studies which indicate... Um, possible to probable preventative effects in Mexico, Peru, um, a couple other places I can't remember, for, from around India, of course, for, for, from, from around the world, that indicates uh, possible to probable prophylactic effects in terms of preventing people contracting COVID-19 in the first place. But you've got to have a cutoff somewhere, and, and this one was on April the 25th, because this is a complex analysis to calculate and indeed uh, to write up. So the team, these are direct quotes in italic, sifted for studies, extracted data and assessed risks of bias. 
meta-analysis were conducted and certainty of evidence was uh, assessed. That's what they do. Now, um, we're going to look at the, what they did in a minute, but just interesting to note here, they use what's called the grade approach. And the grade approach here is on the, um, this is on the uh, Cochrane training site, and it's the grade approach. So let's look at what this is. So that's the Cochrane training site there. That's a good article in BMJ on the grade approach. Grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluations, the grade approach. Now, I obviously knew about this, but um, when you look at this, there's actually whole training packages and textbook sort of things on it. So it's a whole field in its own right, actually. So um, uh, for, for the serious student, there's plenty there on that on that a Cochrane Review training site. Needless to say, we're not going into it. Uh, but, but the point to notice is it's, it's this method is reproducible and transparent framework for grading certainty and evidence. So how sure are we that the evidence is giving evidence for what it says it's doing? This is about validity, the degree to which something does what it says it does. So if it says beans on the tin, and you open the tin and it's got peas inside, that's a non-valid claim, isn't it? But if it says beans on the tin, you open the tin, that's what you get. You get beans and that's a valid claim. It really is as simple as that. But of course, there's degrees of validity uh, in this uh, in these meta-analyses. 100 organisations officially endorse grade. And as we saw, the Cochrane, the main UK one, um, uses that, uh, that, that methodology. Now, what this does... It, it, it is reproducible. Now, it's not saying it's completely objective. It's not a mechanical process. It's not. There is subjective assessment in it, but the subjective assessment is carried out by people with a lot of research analysis experience. And the peer reviewers in this case will have carried out their own grade analysis, one would like to think, and come up with uh, the same conclusions. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a proper peer review. So basically, grade has four levels of certainty of evidence. How sure are we? What is our certainty? And it can either be very low, low, moderate or high. So very low level of certainty, low level of certainty, moderate level of certainty or high level of certainty. That's what this grade thing does. Now, things that would decrease confidence, making things either sort of go down from moderate to low to very low. Risk of bias in the study, imprecision in the studies, inconsistency in the studies, indirectness, that something isn't actually assessing what it's supposed to assess, and publication bias, things that are published and indeed not published. That's the hardest one to assess. So that would tend to put things down into lower categories. But increasing confidence, very large magnitude of effect. So if, if, if lots of people survived in one group and lots of people died in another group, for example. Clear dose response gradient, so the more of the good thing the, the more the better effect. And the third, the third criteria there is residual confounding is likely to do decrease rather than increase the magnitude of the effect. So anything that gets in the way that clutters up the result is likely to decrease rather than increase the magnitude of effect. And of course, if you've looked at previous videos on there, you'll recognise these from the uh, Austin Bradford Hill criteria. So it's not entirely new, but it's been revamped and, 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 and updated. So that's kind of what they're doing. So recognised methodology that can be analysed and reproduced by others. Data sources, 25 randomised controlled trials. Number of patients in, in the studies collectively, 3,406 participants. Right, ivermectin reduced risk of death compared with no ivermectin. Now, the meta-analysis here was 15 trials that contained the mortality data. And in these 15 trials, there was a total of 2,438 patients. And the average risk ratio was 0 0.3. In other words, 62% reduction in deaths. If you were given the ivermectin, your chances of dying were 0 0.38. 62% reduction in the probability of dying. So that is kind of the headline figure that we gave at the start. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite a reasonable figure. Now, the level of certainty here is moderate certainty evidence. So that's the second highest or third lowest level of evidence, depending on how you look at it. So if that's the lowest, second, third, fourth, there you go. So that's where it is. It's at the moderate level of certainty. 
Now, when we talked to Tess about this, actually, we did... Um, I was quite impressed with the fact that she was very conservative. She wasn't making assumptions about how valid how her, her data was or how certain she was. And it appears the peer reviewers uh, agree with that. So moderate certainty evidence. A bit disappointing, a bit disappointing, to be quite honest. Uh, if I'm being honest, I am disappointed that it wasn't high level. But of course, we know that these were mostly based on small scale studies carried out by the clinicians themselves, self-funded. And of course, clinicians are good at clinical work. They are not necessarily absolutely brilliant at organising clinical trials. It's not really their day job. But because there is no big pharmaceutical companies or governments involved in this, this is what we've got. So it's not surprising, really, that that's kind of where we ended up. So we can have moderate certainty that this is uh, an accurate reduction uh, in deaths of 62%, the average risk ratio 0.38. And this was confirmed, now I'm not going to go into these, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't fully understand them, but th these are other ways of assessing the validity of that data other than the grade. So the uh, der Simonian Laird method and the bigger staff Tweedy method. <laughs> so th basically it checked out, in other words, what uh, the team authors are saying here, as well as using grade, they triangulated, triang triangulated the grade results, grading of recommendations, assessment, development and, development and evaluations. They triangulated those with other methodologies and they got the same, um, at least the same direction of results. So, so that's good. They've used different methodologies. And I tell you what, if you, if you actually look through this paper, um, it really is... It really is quite a, a detailed, impressive piece of work. Um, quite, quite, quite. Are oh, the full things not there? Um, um, I, I did download the full paper. I'll, I'll, um, I've got it. Um, just spent the last few hours reading it. Um, but it's it's a very detailed study with lots of um, lots of fairly precise methodological information in it. Um, so. That was that was that result. Sixty two percent protection. So good. Ivermectin versus no ivermectin in hospitalized patients. The ivermectin group, the total mortality was two point three percent of patients died. The non ivermectin group, seven point eight percent of the patients died in hospital uh, cases. So we see quite a nice bit of clear water between those two figures, really, indicating the likely with moderate certainty likelihood that ivermectin is being uh, efficacious so the 62 percent protection 2.3 versus 7.8 now moving on to ivermectin as prophylaxis which we've recently seen for example in india peru mexico uh, did we look at a study in chile as well we looked at a few studies about this and it does look remarkably promising from population-based data but we're only going from what is on here now um, three trials uh, analysed by the trial authors in this one. Uh, the average reduction in transmission was uh, 86% uh, in prophylaxis reducing COVID-19 infection, but this was low certainty evidence. Now, the reason it was low certainty evidence, which of course is the... Um, it wasn't very low, it was low. So it was, it was, it was that one. So, so the reduction in deaths was that one. Uh, the reduction in transmission is that one. No results in the very low, no results in the high. Um, the reason it's a lo low certainty evidence is due to study design limitations and few included trials. But they did find clearly favoured ivermectin use to bring about improvement in patients' condition and prevent deterioration. That was another thing the trial or the meta-analyses authors concluded. Adverse events rare, among, rare amongst treatment trials, evidence of no difference was assessed at low certainty. In other words, they couldn't really tell from the data they had. Um, they couldn't really give a definitive answer to the uh, severe, severe adverse events, how different they were between the two groups. But again, um, other, other studies, and we know ivermectin has been used extensively for parasitic infections, which we've looked at, but this is only looking at what this is looking at. So evidence of no difference was assessed as low certainty. So they couldn't say for sure there was no difference, which is, is the honest opinion. 
Now, uh, the conclusions from the study authors. Now, I put these all in inverted commas because I think it's quite important to, to get them right. These are all di direct quotes. Moderate certainty evidence finds that large reduction in COVID-19 deaths are possible using ivermectin. OK, so that's one conclusion. Using ivermectin early in the clinical course may reduce numbers uh, reduce numbers progressing to severe disease. Certainly consistent with what Dr. Nair was doing in India when we interviewed Pravin Nair a few weeks ago. The apparent safety and low cost suggest that ivermectin is likely to have a significant impact on the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic globally, is the conclusion of the study authors. So that's that. It's not as convincing as we would like but largely due to the limitations and the clinician run nature of the trials but the team clearly the meta-analysis team clearly feel that they have collected enough evidence to indicate efficacy and clinical use now of course I'm not prescribing anything this is purely for educational purposes read the paper yourself and see what it says but that that was what they say the apparent safety with low cost suggests that ivermectin is likely to have a significant impact on the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic globally. And it would certainly have been good if we did have an effective prophylactic agent, because that could have curtailed for things, things like the Delta variant, couldn't it? Because the vaccines don't work straight away, whereas the, the, the idea is that a therapeutic would work within, probably within, oh, I don't know, um, within a few hours anyway, within a few hours. Now, um, let's just compare this with other agencies at the moment for balance. Now, the, um, this is from the National Institutes of Health from the United States, of course, and they have their statement here in a uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, COVID-19 treatment guidelines and fairly well known now. They say there is insufficient data for COVID-19 COVID guideline panel to recommend either for or against the use of ivermectin is their conclusion. Now, of course, we know that the World Health Organization has come out against ivermectin, except in clinical trials, whereas National Institutes of Health in the States has kept this neutral response. And that has been their position since February, I think. Yeah, 11th of February. That's been their position since then. So, direct quote, there is insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19. OK. Um, now, the reason that they give for this, that they can't be more definitive, is the sample size of most of the trials was small. OK, some were a few hundred, but yeah, we, we accept that point. Uh, various doses and schedule of ivermectin were used. Well, of course, this was done by different clinicians around the world. Some of the randomised controlled trials were open label. In, in other words, there could be placebo effects. They, they weren't all double blind, which, of course, is a legitimate critique. Um, patients receiving various uh, concomitant, concomitant, potentially confounding medications, such as doxycycline, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, zinc and corticosteroids. So these could have confused the picture, um, meaning that it's hard to say whether it was these or the synergistic or the inhibitory effects of these with ivermectin that gave the results. So they are saying they are confounding, casting uncertainty on the dependent variable, which is the potential efficacy. The severity of COVID-19 in the study participants was, participants was not always well described. OK, again, fair critique. And the study outcome measures were not always clearly uh, defined again. Um, now, had these trials been done by a large pharmaceutical um, group who are, who are used to doing this or had it been done by a government uh, with, with large sponsorship then these probably wouldn't have occurred but again this is largely clinician-led research so again these limitations aren't surprising but it is frustrating that this definitive answer is just that little bit out of reach although this 62 percent efficacy is probably the best thing we've got so far um so that was the National Institutes of Health on that one. Now, the sort of definitive guide for these things in the UK is the um, Cochrane Library. Trusted evidence, informed decisions, better health is their motto. So, um, Ivermectin for preventing treatment of COVID-19. This was written on April 2021. 
Now, what they've written here is a very detailed proposal for the study, not the study itself. Now, this proposal for the study is probably the best proposal I have ever read for a meta-analysis. It really is quite excellent. So it's got an ivermectin, uh, people that are doing it, um, objectives. This is a protocol for a Cochrane review intervention. The objectives are as follows, but this is what they plan to do. So a description of the condition, which is very well and concisely done. Uh, description of the ivermectin, which is well, is, is well done, how the intervention might work, all well done. Um, but it's all saying what they plan to do. So the objective is to assess the efficacy and safety of ivermectin compared to standard care placebo or any other proven intervention. Again, we will include randomised control trials, so it's not done yet. So this was back in uh, April, and this is the Cochrane Institute, which is like the new UK national flagship. So you've got to re I mean, they've given themselves a very complicated job. But um, you would have thought, given the evidence that we appear to have, they might have given this a slightly higher priority. But let me show you the, the state of play. So Cochrane reviews on this subject, uh, zero. Um, Cochrane Crow protocols, that's what we've just looked at, one. So they've got the protocol, which is good. They're aware of 112 trials. They've written no editorials, uh, no special collections and no clinical answers. In other words, that is completely useless at the moment, which is a bit surprising, as I've said. So the evidence from this meta-analysis, again, I would reinstate, re restate, demands some form of um, response from Dr. Fauci or Chris Whitty, because th there's sufficient evidence there to merit a response, even if it's to say this trial's rubbish, uh, forget it, and uh, we're not going down that route. But as we've said before, the silence is deafening. So they, they go, I must say, I've been looking forward to this meta-analysis for a long time and a bit, I'm a bit disappointed, but having, having read it, I can understand why um, the result is more limited and less definitive than we would like. So there we go. That is my understanding of the ivermectin situation at the moment. 62% um, uh, probable reduction in death with moderate certainty evidence and with low certainty evidence. Um, I've forgotten what it was. It was 86% 86, uh, 86 uh, protection against uh, spread and effectiveness as a prophylactic agent. And that's basically the best we've got at the moment. But this is um, by far the best meta-analysis so far that I'm aware of. So that really is our current definitive state of knowledge on this subject. Right, remember that was educational purposes only. Don't take any medicines based on what I say. <laughs> um, it's always a difficult subject. But um, more, more to come on this and that there are other trials ongoing and planned. And I'm hoping that quite a few countries like India, Mexico, uh, Chile, Peru are going to start writing up definitive papers on their population level studies, which, of course, involve millions of people uh, and the effect particularly on, on, on prophylaxis. So we look forward to more definitive answers in the future. So on that slightly frustrating end, thank you for watching this video.